Welcome back to CodingCat.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Here is Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. Welcome back, peeps, to CodingCat.dev podcast. I have a special guest with me today, Richard. Do you go by Sega or no? Um, so that's a really good question. Sega is the only... Twitter is the only place where you'll see Sega. Okay. When I was in university or, or college, as, as you call it in America, um, I started a magazine for, for 3D animation and I called it Sega. There was an acronym to it. It was like computer entertainment images, something like that. Um, it, it didn't go quite well. My interest changed from 3D to web dev. So I kind of stopped it. But at the time, that's that's why the name Sega. So you can call me Richard. That that makes more sense than than Sega. Yeah, I've, I have you like as Richard Bray, yep. Richard O'Bray, like all over the place. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Sega I, kind of come in. But yeah, anyways, you, you can't change names on Twitter, can you? You have to stick with what you've got. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I changed mine like midway through. Oh, really? It worked out okay. Yeah. Okay. I used I'm, to I'm be on P everywhere, and then I just finally decided to go Coder Cat Dev everywhere. To kind of go okay. with coding cat dev, which of course is completely confusing, but at least people can find me okay. They're yeah, like, hey, yeah. cat guy. And it's like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can totally change it um, if you okay. want to, uh, which maybe with Elon's new rules, you know, who knows? I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> I'll see how it goes. <laughs> so many of you might notice Brittany is not with us today. Uh, we're actually recording this around the holiday seasons and our schedules are all over the place. So she wasn't able to join us today, unfortunately. But uh, Brittany, I, I hope you're watching out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Richard, can you tell us just a little bit more about like your background and how you really started to get into like the content game uh, as a whole? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's, it's such a good question. I don't know where to start. I guess because we've already started on on three D stuff, I can I can start. Yeah. From there. So I, I went to college, university to to make games. I mean, make characters for games. That that was my desire, and so I, I went through that path. And when I graduated, it was really difficult to get a job in in game creation in visual effects. There was a lot of competition, and so during my my course at university, we studied computer. We we did some coding with HTML CSS. Um, I think we did .NET. I can't remember. It's been such oh, a long nice. time. Um, but I fell back on that, and there were a lot of jobs. I wasn't aware of this. I guess I was, but at the time, programming seemed quite boring. Um, <laughs> but I, I found quickly found jobs in it. I, I worked at a startup, and um, since then, my my desire or, or my passion for the web has grown. Um, and I got into the open source community. Just checked out a few products on GitHub and. Um, when I was learning, I, I couldn't find certain resources, I think, for, for Jekyll. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think I, I, I've got the first video course, I want to say, or, or video tutorial on, on Jekyll. Um, Ooh, mine mine was like, a, a, yeah, like a, eight years ago, I, I want to say nine years ago, I put a video out there um, because there wasn't one at, at the time. So when I, when I put it out there, um, people watched it and I thought, oh, this, this is quite cool. I could put more things out there, teach things that don't exist. So most of my content, I'd say up until about a year ago, most of my content was stuff that I couldn't find, but now it's kind of gone into stuff that I know that I want to share with others. So, and yeah. so did you did you continue like thinking down the gaming side too? Because I know here, I'll bring, I'll yeah. bring one of your courses up. You actually have this, this cool course that kind of led me to you, if you will, um, and asking okay. to come on the pod. Um, so this this was out there. I've been trying yeah. to find a, a good way to make 2D games and your yours happened to pop up. I'd never oh, cool. heard of I still can't pronounce it was it Hax Flixel? Hax Flixel, yeah. That, there's a long history behind that. Yeah, um, tell me so, more so, about this. Like what's, what's Yeah, going yeah, on? sure. So so this is um basically I, I wanted to make a game. Um my wife does art and I do coding, so I wanted to join forces and make a game together. Nice. And I, I asked around at work and I asked, what game engine should I use? I, I wanted the kind of low barrier to entry 2D game engine. And at the time, there was a game called Dead Cells that had released. And Dead Cells was built on an engine called Heaps. And Heaps was built on a language called Hacks. So I did some research in, into that. And Hacks is, is not a popular language. It basically came about from the death of Flash. So I think people liked coding in ActionScript. I don't know if you've messed about with ActionScript, um, but people liked the syntax. And yeah. then there's a company called Motion Twin who have, have built their own version of, of ActionScript and, and called it Hacks. Um, 
but you can write in hacks and it can compile to JavaScript, C++, Flash, Python, Java. And so the, the aim is you write your code in hacks and that can go into the web. It can go into consoles. It can go into desktops and mobile. And hacks came out, I want to say in 2005. So it's been around for a while. It's got kind of a, a bad marketing PR team. So not many <laughs> people know about it, but Flixel is a game engine that was built for Flash and then someone ported it to Hacks, so it's called oh Hacks gosh. Flixel. Wow. Yeah, a lot of history. That's that's amazing. So you were able to like kind of build out through this. So, hang on, what 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 uh what language are you actually writing in then? Hacks, H A X C. That's it's the name of the language. Hacks. Yeah, okay. that's yeah, just so hacks. wild to me. Um, yeah. So, did your wife create a lot of these sprites, or how did that? Um, so, so these sprites, <laughs> more history. Basically, the the these sprites are from a game engine. Uh, game engine called Phaser. So Phaser is a popular yeah. JavaScript engine. Definitely. Right. And the, yeah, and, and the person who worked on Phaser, he did some work on Hacksflixel before. So he moved from Hacksflixel to, to Phaser. And these assets are from the Phaser. I think some of them are from the Phaser tutorial. Some of them are from, um, there's a guy called Kenny who puts a lot of assets out there. So just a, a mixture of both. Sorry. Did you freeze? Did I freeze? Um, I, I must have frozen because I think you were there the whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> where, where did you where did, they, where did you lose me? Um, you were just talking about Phaser and um, kind of the the side to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so the person who works on Phaser. Yeah. The, the, uh, the sprites piece. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So so the sprites are from the Phaser tutorial. There's a intro tutorial on Phaser, and there's a mixture of of sprites from that. And I think. There's someone called Kenny who makes some free sprites. There might be some in this one or a different tutorial that I've made. I can't remember. Okay. Um, I, it's funny because my my sons always like love to do that stuff um, as far as games and like 2D games. And obviously like he loves his 2DS and all that stuff. And yeah. he played around with uh, G-Develop for a long time, which was a <laughs> lot more visual. But every time I try to get in, and he, he did Scratch for a long time too. But every time I try to get him into actual coding it's uh mm -hmm. it's been more challenging but it's kind of interesting now with like uh chat gpt and like things like yeah. that with the, the ai automation i feel like we're kind of like in opening up this like next layer of like game creation where someone like my son who's not super interested in the like actual coding he could type out an idea it seems like and that would like produce the code that he's looking for so i'm kind of I'm kind of interested in this like next, I don't know, 20 years of, of what this will be like for gaming. So that's pretty Yeah, sweet. it would be good to see what, what happens. I think you kind of still have to know what you're doing to ask yeah. that GPT yeah. what, what to produce. But yeah, it will make it a lot easier, certainly, to, to build things. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when did you kind of move into, I'm going to create this massive YouTube channel that you've <laughs> like, you started curating like some awesome tutorials and things like that. Uh, you kind of mentioned like when you're, when you're searching for something, um, mm -hmm. and you can't find it, you'll make something, but what, yeah. what kind of keeps you going in content? Cause I always, I often feel like content burned out. Like I'm like someone else has made this already. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I get a lot of people in the Hacks uh, Discord server asking me to do things because my tutorials on YouTube are probably the most popular for Hacks Flixel and Hacks in general. So nice. I often get a lot of questions saying, can you teach this? Can you teach that? And um, I haven't found a lot of time to do it because like you, I've, I've got kids and so it's difficult to, to find time around things. But it's, yeah, it's difficult to, to keep the momentum, but they do it they, they always give me feedback saying this is such a helpful helpful tutorial i wouldn't have got this far without you i was looking for this for months and i finally found it and that gives me the motivation to make more tutorials and to put more content out there that's really cool and your your day job does that kind of help with that i think last i in my notes i have caution your blast yeah that's caution your blast yeah I, I still work there full time um i'm, I'm trialing something out so what i'm doing is working four days a week and then using one day for content creation wow so nice. it's it's nice that they allow me to do that i think for for the past few months i've done it in a compressed way so i've worked 10 hours from monday to thursday and then had friday to myself but what i'm going to do now is, is try doing 80 percent. so monday to, to thursday 
regular time and then I'll, I'll have Friday for content creation. So um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I, I might write an article about it if it's a good thing or a bad thing. And then we'll, yeah, we'll see what people think. I have a feeling uh, your brain probably works a lot like mine where it's like, oh, I have an idea. I got to like write that down and, and yeah. store it away for my Friday stuff. Do you, yeah, did yeah. you find during your like condensed 40 hours in four days, like were you still able to to kind of let your brain kind of release and like go off in the content world or were you too focused? Um, that is a good question. I think that there are times when there was a lot of work to do, so I, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't have that freedom. Um, but when there was less work, I could occasionally write things down, maybe uh, record something really quickly and then I'll do some editing on the side. So it, it depends on the workload. But I, I think, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of freedom to, to do things. Nice. Yeah. And, and, th and uh, thank you for, for giving me, uh, what's the word, G giving me feedback on, the, on my channel, giving me like flattery or, or compliments because I, I find it really helpful that people find my content. And even though I've only got like 2K subscribe subscribers, it's nice to know that yeah people still I, find it i think it's really cool um personally like th there's all kinds of like youtube algorithms and and like yeah. what what cover images work and what don't blah 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 but i love channels like yours and here i'll put it back up there a sec um i love when it's just like i know exactly where to look and i know like this is the title and for me like that really works out really well i don't need the flashy yeah. like I don't know, face on fire type stuff um, <laughs> that, that are supposed to like grab people as they're searching. Um, I think that works really well on a, a channel setup basis. I don't know if it plays in with like when people are searching, grabbing that stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you have a, a nice unique field too with the, the hack stuff that really uh, draws people in. So it, it gets people there really quickly. Thanks. Um, I, I'm curious. You also had listed out uh, this Hello Light Bulb. Can you yeah, tell me? Yeah, sure. What? Oh, what man, you, you've gone deep down the rabbit hole of my yeah, content. Yeah, um, I, I tried yes. to do my research. I don't know. <laughs> so Hello Light Bulb is, is a, a, a company, or, or just basically my wife and I are making games. So we've made a few games and we've published them under Hello Light Bulb. So, um, yeah, we've made a few games for Jam. So, so this, the first game that you're seeing on, on the left was for the GitHub Game Jam, I think 20... Yeah. 21. Yeah, 21 we didn't win it yeah. but um it, it was a fun process and yeah we we learned a lot making that game so all, all the assets there she made and i did the programming in hacks flixel um yeah so, it's, it's, it's quite a nice language I, I enjoyed doing it can you tell me a little bit more just about um like what it what it takes in hacks and and kind of your process for putting something like that together um yeah let's let's pause just one second i gotta throw an advertisement okay. uh, a sponsorship in here but then let's come back and chat about that real quick sure how in the world could i forget about this there's no need to freak out we have story block robert you're right but we still need a plan okay how much time do we have left until the launch 24 hours okay let's go We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. Huge thanks to Storyblocks there for sponsoring us. Long time partnership there. Um, uh, love love their new video too. So uh, look for that in 2023 coming out. Um, so yeah, I was just I was just asking you kind of about the the game that you guys had put together. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not a game creator, so I'm always kind of curious when I look at stuff like this, like how many different sprites or like images of each one of these, like what does that look like when you as a programmer, like let's say were to ask your wife, hey, I need this lady that runs away from a net. Like what does that process look like and go through? I think you're making it sound a lot more complex than it okay. actually is. It's, it's, it's really simple. Um, so... This, the, the way this works in, in terms of sprites and sprite sheets, I think there are sprite sheets in CSS, so it, it kind of works in a similar way, but yeah. the the animation is, um, I think it's eight frames a second for, for the running. And so she does all the illustrations with a tool called Procreate on, on an iPad because she draws with Apple yep. Pencil and then refines it in Illustrator. And then she makes uh, she, she makes a sprite sheet, but uh, hang on, that's not true. She, she gives me the images individually. And there's a tool that I use called 
texture packer. So this is a new uh, pipeline in our process where I get all the images and it packs them automatically into the most compact sprite sheet. So oh, wow. the the images won't be um, perfect. They won't have like perfect, what, what's you call it, space in between them. They could be rotated, they could be upside down just to pack it on as much as possible. And then it creates oh, a JSON yeah. file that gives I information see. about each um, sprite. So then I read the JSON file in the code and then um, all, all the sprites are named. So there'll be running sprites, there'll be a jumping sprite, climbing sprite, all in the same image. And I'll read the JSON to, to get the, the sprites for the animation and then play the animation based on what the player is pressing, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. That's pretty wild yeah. too. So yeah, yeah. For, for my limited experience, if, if you're pushing like right and she has to run mm -hmm. right, that might mm -hmm. cover like three sprites at a time, right? Because yep. it's leg kind of moving forward type of thing. That's, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. I game game design always blows my mind. Like it seems super complicated, but I feel like it's more it's it's not complicated. It's just very tedious. Like there's so yeah. many things that you have to add together. Yeah, I, th I think if if you're comparing it to web, it's yeah. definitely more complex than than web. There yeah. are things like design patterns, like using React or or using like Svelte or Vue. The uh, framework builders have got done a lot of the hard work and they put it behind the scenes. But when you're making a game, yes, the game engine does do a lot of hard work, but there are still things that need to be put in place. And so I had never used a design pattern. Um, sorry, not design pattern. What's the word? A, um, there's, there's like these things, like a single, I don't know if you've heard of a singleton or like oh, a, a sure. state machine. Yep. I, I've forgotten what they're called. But yeah, I'd never used one before making games. I've never used it for the web. And then making games, I had to learn about how they work and how to use them. And yeah, it's just a, another level of, of complexity or another way of coding, basically. Sure. I think I, I kind of grew up, uh, Java was my first language in, in okay. university. And um, when we had to do all of the like class-based, object-oriented, you know, polymorphism, singleton, like all of that yeah. stuff, I thought I was going to use that the rest of my life and like programming <laughs> was super complicated. And then I got in the web and everything became like functional and super easy. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Like mine, mine went the other way, but um, yeah. So when you, when you're using like hacks uh, and, and using like an engine like that, if we, if we take an image like this, where mm -hmm. it's like the mushroom, I assume like there's gravity involved and yep. the, the mushroom itself has like limitations to it and the person jumping on it. Like, can you just walk through like visually looking at this, what a yeah. game developer would actually like talk to themselves as seeing as far as constraints on each of those objects and what it would take. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. it's, it's, this is a really good question. And I'm impressed if we've been able to think about, this in, in such a way because most people wouldn't think about that but yeah so so the mushrooms are just straight up pngs the images okay and there, there's a lot of um like i don't know if the, what the correct word is like borders or, or boxes or shapes overlapping them that okay. you can't see that have different attributes so over the the blue and the orange mushroom is kind of like a shape that matches just the blue and the orange bit and it's been coded so that when when the player the, the box around the player interacts with the blue mushroom and the player is facing that blue mushroom and it interacts with, with that box, then the player will climb. And there's also a box around the, the stalk of the mushroom, which prevents the player from walking past it. So it's like a gotcha. collision box. Um, and there's also a, a box on the floor that pre prevents the player from falling to the ground. So yeah, a lot of in invisible boxes. I think they're called um, invisible walls in games. So okay. yeah, there, there are things in place that people can't see, but have restrictions and, and logic and stuff. That's pretty wild. I, I love the aspect that you can almost design your own world, uh, kind of like virtual world, uh, even though these are like 2D. Uh, yep. I just, it always takes me back to the original like moment of Super Mario for me. Like that's as simple as any of this ever had to be, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it's been uh, progressively kind of growing as far as like frameworks and languages and um the open world stuff have you gotten into any yeah. like the 3d like any yeah. of that side of things so so I, i've modeled 3d assets before that that's one of the reasons why i, I went into uni to do that okay. but in terms of making a game um I, 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 that's a lot more work i don't think it can be done by two people like my, my wife and myself i think you need a whole team i mean i, I know it can be done because there are people who have made games like that with different assets and different tools to generate things without them manually making it but if you wanted to hand design a game and have these 
custom levels with custom art it would take a long time to do with just two people so i haven't looked into it i, I know that it's it's similar to 2d in a way but there's more kind there's another dimension so another yeah. dimension of of um invisible walls another yeah. dimension of physics like cubing, yeah, there's, there's right? a lot more. yeah yeah a lot more involved and when it comes to open world I, I can't imagine where to start with that because some yeah. of those games are, are so complex. I, I looked at um, a, a video of, with a game called Hor Horizon Zero Dawn a while back, and there's a technique they use where they only show bits on the screen that the camera is facing. So if, if the camera is facing, I don't know, a, a house, then you see the house, but if the camera isn't facing the house and everything behind the house is invisible. And so when you're rotating, it just pops up the assets that the camera can see. And I wouldn't know where to start with doing yeah. that sort of logic. Yeah, that's kind of crazy to think about for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about your, so the the kind of title, which I probably should have mentioned at the very beginning of this, it's content creation, because yeah. at, at the end of it, you're still, like even in your games, like you are still creating content. And even when I look at like this one, what, like how does this even appear in your mind like how do you think of hey we're gonna create this thing called scales mm -hmm. and like we're, are you creating the story is your wife creating it are both of you and like here's how it's gonna end here's the beginning like you almost have to write a story out don't you yeah yeah so, so this game did have a storyboard at, at the beginning so th there's a lot more in this game that we didn't get time to put into place i think it's a fraction of the size you wanted it to be but it did have a storyboard and as you can see in this image, there, there are multiple characters. And yeah, we, we wanted to, I'm just, I can't remember the style we wanted to replicate, but there's a style of a game, like a, a pixel type old school game we wanted to replicate. Um, have you heard of a game called Guacamole? It's like a, a mm, no, that's that fine. No. So so we wanted to match that art style. Guacamole is, isn't pixel, it's, it's like flat design, but we wanted to have that sim simplicity. Yeah, yeah, okay. that, that sort of thing. So I wanted to have that simplicity in design, but have a pixel style. And Guacamole is a platformer game, and Scales is also a platformer. So, so there are, are some similarities. I think most of the games that we've made, we've borrowed ideas from other games. But yeah, it's, th this game was actually quite difficult because the the player or, or the animal is a pangolin. The pangolins aren't, aren't that well known. They're, they're actually endangered. But the, the sprite itself has got a lot of... Um, boundaries around it so so the tail has some logic and the feet have, have some logic and when you jump the character rolls into a ball so the the collision box changes size to match the ball and so it, it took me ages to figure out how to do that but yeah it, we got something in the end I'm not I mean it, it works I'm not proud of it if I were to look back at the code but it's it's good enough I think every developer I've ever talked to they're they're always wanting to go back and you know fix code and correct things yeah I think you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, from again, from a non non game dev. Um, so I work a lot with Firebase from the web side of things. I work for App right mm -hmm. now. I'm looking at this, going, okay, well, the little creatures that are like going left to right, do those mm -hmm. have to like in a database? Do you have to know you killed that creature? Like, how much data does this actually take to? Like, let's say you died right there in, in the fire pit mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. and you could restart from that spawn point. Like, are mm -hmm. you recording that live and in, in the background too and pushing data up and down? Yeah, another really good question. Um, from what I remember, I, I think I did experiment with that. So experiment with having a, a JSON file with the attributes of, of all of the enemies and then remembering if, if one has died or not. I, I don't think I'd go that far. I, I think I remember the, so there are certain checkpoints when the player hits the checkpoint at all load them back in that position if, if they die or if they pass the checkpoint and die. But in terms of... And, um, and that checkpoint, like I assume you're capturing that in a database or or something like local data. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's all in memory. So okay. <laughs> well, memory. I, I, I think if... So I, the benefit of keeping it in memory is is if a player were to to load the game, it wouldn't have to make an API call to get data from a database. It will just oh, yeah. all be in, in the player's browser. So it's, it's a lot quicker. Um, I think bigger games do have databases. I, I am aware of, of games having databases, but this was actually one of our first games we built in Hackers, and so I, I didn't want to get that deep into it. Yeah, but sure. Yeah, so so most things are in memory in a JSON file. The save data has a lot of information. It's a, it's a massive JSON file with a bunch of information about how what level they've completed, how far they've gotten a certain level, um, how many bugs they, they killed. I, I think I've got that data. Yeah, I do have that because certain levels 
you have to kill or get past a certain number of bugs to complete them. So I do record how many bugs have, have killed in what position. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just taking up browser memory if, if you're playing in the browser. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And as far as um, getting back to like the content creation side of things, mm -hmm. uh, when you're when you're creating like a series of videos, what what's that take for you to like say, OK, we're going to create a game like this and I want to show how to create it um, from a video perspective. Let me bring up like just one of your, your videos here. Um, so like we start to show something like this and you have yeah. just walking through code and, and showing that video. What are you doing to kind of outline that, and um, so that someone can absorb uh, all the all the cool stuff that you're doing, but still be able to implement it on their own? What does yeah. that process look for, like for you for an outline? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think when I'm building the games, that there are certain parts of it that I wouldn't touch if I was making content because it's either too complex or it, it goes into too much detail. I, I try to make my content beginner slash intermediate friendly. So I'd probably make a, a much simpler game or a, have a small slice of that game and okay. then go through the process of, of making that. And there are certain parts that I'd, I want to focus on. So like when it comes to character um, character and animation or character movement, I'd focus on that and then talk about different ways to do it and the way that I'd do it. But um, yeah, there's, there's not really, a, it's not really as detailed or as, as well planned as, as you might think it's just kind of i think this is cool i want to teach it i'm gonna make a small project and then show how i built that small project and then share it with the world that's cool i love that i think it's i think it's super useful or beneficial when when you are like really excited about that piece of something you can show it off mm -hmm. and when people are looking for it i think they really uh grasp onto the fact like they see your energy. They want to be energetic towards that. And like that helps yeah. the whole like content piece as a whole. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, so what projects, uh, if you don't mind me asking, do you think you have lined up for 23? Uh, I don't know how much I can talk about. So I, okay. I, I, I finished a course with, with Treehouse at the end of the year, close to the end of the year on, on TypeScript, which I really enjoyed. And I think shout out to the Treehouse team. They're, they're really cool. Um, they, they've been very helpful with, with showing me how to create the course and giving me feedback. And yeah, just, just the editing behind the course, it, it's, it looks completely different from what, what I gave to them to how they've changed it and made, and oh, made it really? better. Wow. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of the, the editing, so, so the course that I gave them is pretty much the same, but the audio quality, the, the way they've cut it is, is really good. That's right. Um, cool. Yeah, so, so I don't know if I can say this, <laughs> but basically the, the, there'll be more courses with different people coming in the future. Very Let's cool. Go. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I, I'll look forward to it. Maybe you can ping me and uh, we'll add a little extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll hit you up in the Discord or something. Sounds good. Um, do, you, do you think that you'll stick with uh, kind of just the programming side? Do you think you'll stick with web? Do you think you'll move like into games? Like wh where's your head at as far as like excitement level and where you want to take things? Yeah, I, I keep saying good question, but you ask really good questions. You're, you're a I very try. good interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so the YouTube side of, has has been quite confusing for me because I, I started out or started out with web, and I moved more more to game, and then I've kind of tried to go back into web, but the community that that's built around my YouTube channel has been has been the game side. So people respond more to yeah. the game development content. Um, I've got Discord, and people in that Discord are more game dev people. So. I'll, I'll probably focus more on game dev for YouTube. I, I do web for a day job, so there's stuff that I'll learn that I want to share on yeah. YouTube, but I'll probably more focus on game dev for YouTube. And then when it comes to other things, I think TikTok, I've, I've recently started a TikTok and most of the content on there has been web and that seems to be going quite well. So I'll probably stick to web on TikTok and yeah, I'll, I'll just see how that goes. I'll just do different things on different platforms. So it'll be half web, half game dev, maybe more web because that's what people are, that's what people want. That's more in demand and people who have approached me for courses and videos um, have been more web. But you, the community you that I have- like a whole like onion layer for me here because like- Oh really? 
the YouTube shorts and, and Twitch and uh, I guess uh, Instagram uh, reels and stuff like that, yeah. all, all kind of using that vertical format. Yeah. I'm curious, like, what is your goal as far as lengthwise and, and kind of how small is this content breakdown for you and how many will you release in a row? Like, I have so many questions. So <laughs> let's, let's yeah. start with like, what, what kind of content do you think people can absorb in like a 30 to 60 second snippet? Yeah, so, so just like, what is something? So what is a function? What is a callback? What yeah. is a closure? Just like those, those sorts of things, answering them and showing a code example or a code snippet, they seem to work like quite well. Like an MSDN page or a MSDN, yeah. MSN, yeah. whatever, page yeah. of a description. Like that's pretty much your boom. There's, there's one to do. Yeah, yeah, just I, something I, short. I saw one from West Boss the other day with like these these brackets coming down to describe each part of like a function. And I'm like, that's it. Like, that's what yeah. I'd like to do. But I, I have to imagine that probably took him a full day to make. Like, it's yeah. such an intense thing to make a small, like 60 second thing. And it's it's hard from a if you ever want to split out from your day job and do this full time, like the way that they like monetize shorts and things like that is ridiculous. Like you'd have to get a million views for that to even like be worth $10. Like it's silly. Yeah. So, uh, I'm always curious when people start talking about like kind of that next step of what they're getting into, just how far like you'll take it. Yeah. I, th I think it's, it's engaging that I get more views on my TikTok videos than my YouTube yeah. shorts. So people are engaging with it, but you're right. It's a shame. You have to get a lot of views to get, money from it or to make a decent amount of money from it and yeah. it's, it's difficult to to get that balance how much time should i spend on making short form content it's yeah but i'm, I'm enjoying it so far and i i think there's a community building around tiktok that are web develop web developers so usually beginners there's a yeah. lot of python on tiktok as well but yeah python javascript and a lot of developers are commenting on my videos and asking for more videos to be made so yeah we'll see how far i can go with that uh, you've got me very curious now. I might have to look into it further. I, we have a TikTok account, but it yeah. just it does not get content like this. So it's it's kind of I'm always trying to like wrap my head around and and like watching my son watch videos is very enlightening mm. because I feel like a 13 year old and probably younger their brain like span to like watch videos. They have no patience whatsoever. Yeah, like, yeah flip, which is flip, the same. Flip, flip. <laughs> it's yeah, it's next crazy. generation. If, if you want to get content to the next generation, you've got to put it on TikTok or Shorts or yeah. Reels I just, or something my like biggest that. fear is, are they learning through it though? Like, are they actually consuming enough in that short amount of time that they can learn something? So I don't know. Yeah, I'm kind of question. curious. Yeah. yeah I, I, always, I always feel like for me, if I could like take a video and make a programming course, but then the chapters that I would like break out, maybe that's enough for the TikTok video. I don't know, like one chapter per. <laughs> I can't imagine that. I can't imagine having enough information to quest into one I 60 seconds. Yeah. But, but when I edit my, my short content video, it's difficult just to get it that small. I have to cut out so much information yep. to get it un under a minute. I think yep. TikTok, you can put more than a minute on there, but for YouTube yeah. Shorts, it's, it's less than a minute. So yeah, I'd read like yeah. YouTube uh, expanded theirs, but I haven't I haven't looked into okay. it, so I'm not sure where they're at now. Um, do you mind me asking, like, what do you actually produce your your verticals in? Um, was it Streamlabs OBS? I don't know if you've heard of that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I I, I just uh, use Slabs that, um, or whatever they call it. Yes, yeah, like <laughs> such a horrible name, but yeah, yeah. That, that's what I use. <laughs> I I find it quite convenient because it's the recording process is quite quick and yeah. I, I can view the content as I'm recording or see it before I'm recording just to make sure the code is visible and yeah. my face yeah. is visible and, and all that stuff. That's really nice. Yeah. I, I've been using, um, uh, screen flow for many years okay. yeah. that'll record and you can pop in, pop out, whatever you want, zoom to things. Um, but I haven't, I haven't messed with that on the vertical side. So I, I'm kind of curious for people out there and I'd love to see comments. Like if you're watching this, please comment mm -hmm. on what you're using. Um, I'm really curious on like the fastest way to get content out there, um, doing that. So yeah. we'll see. Uh, what am I missing? I feel like you have an entire link tree of just, fun stuff i feel like i must be missing something uh i don't think the hack stuff is, is pretty deep for, so you did well for finding that uh let me try and think 
you have your first shader that's all the hacks flexible oh right yeah Sh shaders are, are quite fun they're, they're difficult to program oh. because you, you can do shaders in the web as well you, i think it's like webgl you can yeah. you can create shaders but it's it's crazy it's, there's not much documentation on it and the language for writing a shader is, is like c and they're, <laughs> they're so powerful you, you can you can create amazing effects with them i think for AAA games so like like the games you see on playstation and nintendo and xbox they have code that automatically generates shaders based on where you are in the level. Mm. I can't imagine how they do that, but yeah, sh shaders are weird and powerful things, and it, it's it's a shame they're not utilized more on the web. And I can see why, but it's it's kind of that they're great, but not, not many people use them. Nice. Yeah. Well, I think I think we touched a lot of all of your stuff. Um, we usually do some perfect picks, so. Okay. If we want to take a pause, anything that uh, you've you've checked out recently or uh, watched on Netflix that you're really digging that you could uh, show off for a perfect pick, I'll give you I'll give you a minute. I'm gonna show oh, off my my latest obsession. Uh, I forgot to bring it up. Hang on one sec. So here is Jack Ryan season three. Uh, I I basically started this late one night and didn't sleep because i was so hooked to it i still think season one of jack ryan is is the best season there is uh although I, this was pretty it was pretty engaging for sure and, and the topic was was pretty great dealing with soviet union and stuff like that or russia however however you want to look at it. so that's my perfect pick for this episode and uh, you, you put me on the spot i've I know. I got no idea yeah, we, we can we can edit this out you can you can kind of uh Think about it if you want for a minute. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, oh. that's a really good question. Really good question. I gotta not forget to uh, put this in my perfect pick list here. Any fun uh, Christmas things you bought for someone? That's always a fun <laughs> pick. Um. I, I've only bought gifts to my wife, and and I, okay, let me think. There's a, uh, no, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go go back to the content side of things, like like just sure. Uh, I'm, I I watch I, I don't actually watch a lot of Netflix or, or Amazon stuff. I I recently watched Lord of the Rings, the, the Rings of Power. I oh, haven't finished yeah. it, but that that's quite good. I think I, I might have to. Um, yeah, Rings of Power. I haven't finished it. I've only, we're only like two or three episodes in. But fun fact: the the um, the loading screens for Illustrator and Photoshop uh, screens from from this series. I don't know why Adobe partnered with Amazon in this, but yeah, it's quite a fun fact. Um, so wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying the loading screens Adobe partnered with Amazon? With I think Amazon. That's or, or Tolkien, I, I don't know. But yeah, for Illustrator and Photoshop, the loading screens are, um, I think they're concept art or, or graphic design images from Lord of the Rings, this, wow. this series. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty wild. I did not know that one. That's a fun one. I'll have to see if I yeah. can find a blog or something on it. Yeah. yeah it's, well, it's, it was a shocking discovery when I opened up Photoshop <laughs> and I was like, hang on, this, this looks familiar. <laughs> Where is this from? Shocking and frightening all at the same time. Yeah. No, it's very cool. Well, yeah, th thank you so much for uh, for joining me today on the CodingCat.dev podcast. I can't wait to see no what you're doing in uh, 2023. Sounds like you got some things in the works already. Yep, so, yeah, well, no uh, worries. Um, also, also, thank you for having me on the podcast. I, I know you've had big guests like Tom Preston Warner, uh, James Quick. You've had like big people, and I'm just uh, a small-time content creator. Big. You're big. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Everybody's awesome <laughs> that comes on. So I, I always just appreciate the time that people can carve out in their day to uh, to meet up. This is what it's all about, yeah. is uh, showcasing you. So thanks so much again. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. All right, you too.